Um, I'm Jasper Williams. I'm pastor emeritus here at Salem Bible Church. My son serves as senior pastor of the church. And as you may know, I uh, was privileged to have been selected by Aretha Franklin herself to bring her eulogy. And I did that on this past Friday, which of course is the last um, day of the month of August. That was particularly interesting to me because 34 years ago to the month, I eulogized her father, the Reverend C.L. Franklin, who was the pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church where Aretha served with her father. Um, there's a commonality that exists between um, myself and Aretha. Uh, one, it goes back to our heritage. My father, my uncle, and Reverend C.L. Franklin were all from Mississippi. And when they came to Memphis, they came for the purpose of pastoring. And um, that meant in that day for those pastors, it was quite a thing for them to come from Mississippi and get to Memphis. Memphis in preacher talk was a kind of Jerusalem. Once you became a pastor in Memphis, it was a greatness about you as a preacher and bearer of the gospel. So my uncle, my father, and the Franklin family lived on Lucy Street, which is the street that Aretha was born on. My father lived down the street from them. My uncle, who I call Uncle Buddy, lived two or three doors over from them, and that was a great camaraderie between the two of them. They played checkers every day. He was like close bosom confidant friend. And uh, they would kick back, talk and relax, and talk smack as preacher talk. And so that having come from Mississippi and all sort of locked the past with Aretha and my past in that we came to be friends as the years went on. And as I told you, I was privileged to preach her funeral. She asked me to do that. And the family asked me. And so here we are. I did the funeral on this past uh, Friday. I don't know if you have questions that you want to ask me, then you feel free to say and ask whatever you choose. Brother Williams, you've had a chorus of critics and a wealth of supporters. Your thoughts on the pushback, the aftermath of it from your well, I like to think that um, it's no pushback about what I said. It could be that they did not understand what I was saying. If you tell me which area you would like for me to cue in on, I'd be glad to address that, Maynard. Well, you, you talked about women not able to raise the children properly. Is that correct? The way that you are internalizing that they felt is incorrect. I did not mean that they're not able to raise their children. I'm talking about many single women struggling to raise their children. And in the black community, there is no mentoring for the children. And that when a boy is there, for example, and our houses, 70 plus percent of our households are headed by our precious women. And as precious, beautiful, and proud as they are, they cannot teach a boy how to be a man. So one of the ails and ills that we have in the African-American community is that too many of our homes are headed by women without men in the house. Now, it's been too many women who've raised excellent men. Jesse Jackson, one of my dearest friends, was raised by a single mom, see? But the women need help in their homes, and our race needs to become sensitive to that, to be able to do that. But do you think that's appropriate for you to do that in? Well, I was a eulogist, okay? No one else was asked to bring the eulogy but me. And so I feel that it is appropriate for me to say what it is that I want to say and how it is that I want to say it, because I was the only one asked to do the eulogy. And if you were there or heard about it, I sat there for seven hours almost before I got a chance to do what I was asked to do. 
So I couldn't get all of the intricacies that I wanted in the message because it was too much time. People had grown weary of the hour. You also spoke on Black on Black Crime and Black Lives Matter movement. Yes. Can you clarify what you were trying to say there? I'm saying that uh, when we as a race uh, sit back and get mad if a police officer kills one of us, see, and we don't say anything when a hundred of us are killed by us, that something is wrong with that. I'm not saying that black lives do not matter in terms of the worth of a black life. But what I'm saying in essence is that it does not matter, ought not matter, should not matter, cannot matter, until black people begin to, Aretha, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect black lives. Only then will black lives matter. Now, that's what I said, and that's what I meant. Does it bother you that the conversation has now been about your comments in certain parts of your eulogy instead of about Aretha Franklin or the prospect of respect? Does it bother me? No, it doesn't bother me, but uh, all I can do is continue to work at what I'm trying to do, to continue to work and help our people come out of the daze and trance that we're in. I don't think that we ought to continuously sit back and wait for somebody to help us. I think that our role as a race should come from within us and that we do for ourselves. Nobody can put values in people. We can't pay for the government to give us the values that we ought to live by. Our values have to come from within, and somebody has got to care, and I care enough to say it and do it. What do you think Ms. Franklin would have said if she heard your eulogy? I don't know what she would have said, uh, but she asked, she trusted me to do it. I don't want to see Aretha's life stopped at Grace Temple Church in Detroit. I want to see Aretha's life immortalized. And because of the great contributor that she was to the civil rights movement and all that she gave, I would think that if I'm doing something to turn black America around, that she would be pleased. Are you, su are you surprised by the reaction that your words have garnered over the last few days? When you say surprised, no, I'm not surprised because I've been preaching 68 years and I've had one surprise after another to the point that I'm numbed to surprises now. I'm not surprised. I just wish somebody would understand my heart and understand what I'm trying to do. And instead of making mockery or creating difficulty or spins opposite of what I am intending, that's what hurts me more than anything else. Good question, sir. The young people you think misconstrue what you have to say as opposed to our generation? Has there been a chasm between what young folks are saying and... I mean, you've been around a long time, and one thing you know, the generations are the same. Not on just this issue, but there are innumerable issues where generations like you and I and generations of the millenniums, the net generation, the we generation, however they choose to be called, can be opposite sometimes. But the point is this, whether you old school or new school, respect for each other is the key to us changing the road that we're on as a race. How did your congregation this morning, uh, how did they come to you? Did they, did they say something to you about it? or? Everybody came to me congratulating me. They were happy about what I said. They congratulated me. And the reason is because they know what we have been trying to do way before this eulogy came about. See, I'm not working to be on television. I haven't called either one of you all to come and have an interview with me. I don't care whether you're here or you're not here. I'm going on and I'm going to do what we need to do because it has to come from within our race. Pastor. Yes, sir? Yesterday I spoke. On, uh, a, at a prayer breakfast that dealt with the violent uh, death in the Macon Bill County community. 
28 murders in Macon this year, 30 last year. Uh, and I want you to know, this was held at Glory Hope uh, Missionary Baptist Church, and you may uh, uh, know the pastor, Pastor Harry, down there. But I want you to know that uh, the panelists on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the panel, to a person, the sheriff, echoed your sermon. The coroner echoed your sermon. There was a judge, a magistrate court judge, echoed your sermon. And of course, that was me, and, and I echoed your sermon. It appears to me that your uh, eulogy has brought some sore spots out in the black community that probably need to have the light shine upon them uh, ages ago. Now that they're front and center, what can you do or have you thought about now that these issues are before the public, carrying them forward? Let's have, it's probably time to have a dialogue about these issues because before too long the black community has said uh, there's nothing wrong with us when someone pointed to the fact that blacks are killing blacks uh, they will say, shush, shush, uh, we got to really jump on the police officers for doing it. But you seem to break that paradigm. What can you do in the future to keep this issue alive in the community so that we will have a good, frank, and honest dialogue and tackle this problem? Because uh, as you, as I believe you aptly put it on Friday, if we do not address this, you know, we will never get our souls back. Sir, that's an excellent question. And I appreciate the time that you obviously have, have put into structuring that question. Um, I feel that we ought to respect each other enough to listen. I don't care what another person's opinion is. My opinion alone is not all gold. I'm willing to listen to those kids, you know. They got some things about themselves that we all ought pattern after. So if I'm going to stand up here, I'm not standing here to be the Lone Ranger, like I know everything and been everywhere and have done everything because I'm not. I would love to sit and listen to whatever they say. They may say something that we need to mesh into what we're doing. It's going to take all of us to turn black America around, all of us even those who don't want to, it's going to take that. You said the sermon was Thank you. a queen of soul, but black people have lost their soul? Was that part of the, that, or those are the dots you tried to make? The point is that she's called Aretha the Queen of Soul in 1964 at the Regal Theater in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Spain Cooper crowned her Queen of Soul. My message said to them that before then, back before the morning star, before the sons of God cried out for joy, before there was ever a when or a where, a why or a which, God crowned her queen of soul. And then I authenticated it with the Bible in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, is what the book says. And I was connecting the dots, as you referenced, with that creation of man to be that of the creation of Aretha, and I was doing my best to lock all of that into a common cause. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to those who have not necessarily given you the respect that you're yeah. talking about in their uh, I don't respond to them negatively. You know, I understand the pain. I understand the hurt. I understand a community where we don't have any economical growth anymore. We own no drug stores, no grocery stores, no banks. We don't have anything in our community but devastation. So I understand the pain. I understand the hurt. All I'm asking is I'll listen to you, and that would be fine. And whatever you say to me is fine. But I am not going to respond to you, sweet people, negatively. All I ask is for you to come on board. 
I help you, you help us, and together we turn our race around. Are you concerned at all about how perhaps conservatives, right-wingers, the Trumpists would take your message and turn it around, you think? Well, that's an excellent question, but I don't think that this is a juncture where anybody can do anything for us but us. And until we reach down on the inside of ourselves and touch our souls and decide that this is enough, it's time to turn around. Until that happens, it doesn't make any difference about how much money the government would give or whatever the case is. To me, this is not about dollars. This got to be about an inner calling of the inner man to do what's right about our people. A lot of people after getting so much reaction from their, because you were on a national level in that moment, they would try and walk it back or explain in a different way. Can you explain why you're not stepping back or stepping down from what you've done? Because the answers to our problem is not back or down. The answer to our problem is forward and up. And that's what I would like to see us do and be. Ma'am, you're excellent at what you do. I don't know where you're from. Which, which, which station are you from? 11 Oh, you are? You're quite a lady. Thank you for your presence. I appreciate Thank you. I'm a man. <laughs> oh, you are? <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Some are using that argument saying it wasn't because it was a funeral, but others are saying it was the perfect time and place because it was when everybody was together and you had such a voice, such a national audience. Yes. Do you take one side or the other, or what kind of, where do you stand on that? I was the eulogist. I was the one who was asked to eulogize, and I feel that I did it appropriately. I think that I honored Aretha through it all. And I feel that in honoring her, I picked out various issues that are going on within our community and made that part of the forefront. I think I tried, I tried to do the best that I could, ma'am, under the circumstances and situations. Now, we, we all mess up sometimes. Sometimes you don't preach as good as you know you can. And after sitting there seven hours, <laughs> all the preach I had in me was gone. <laughs> And I just took the opportunity of doing it the best that I could under the circumstances and situations I was in. I meant nobody, no harm, and yet I meant the truth. That's it. I can't answer it any other way. Pastor, you said two weeks ago when it came to the preacher. Huh? Yes, sir. Uh, someone asked you, you, asked you to define eulogy, and you broke it down to a Greek. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Okay, the the word eulogy in the Greek vernacular comes from the basic logos. The word logos means word, and EU is a prefix that translates good. So then a eulogy is speaking a good word about the one who died. That's what a eulogy is. The good word, as I see as it relates to Aretha, is that going forward, as black America changes and turns around, we immortalize her with what she said, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. She would be at the root of this pivotal turn and change that we're hoping can come about in black America. Do you think that eulogy met that standard? I don't know. Do you? I don't know. I don't like to brag on me. But whatever way you feel is all right with me. If you think it did not, that's fine. I received that as well. If you think it did, I'm fine with that. But what I think is what I did. Now, whether it's negative or positive to you, sir, I don't know. But it's what I meant. You have a curriculum moving forward now, right? It's not just 
Yes, I have a curriculum and all of that, and I have a plan for what we're doing, but I don't want to talk about that now. Uh, on down the line. This is, this is a race thing. This is a thing with our race. I don't want to publicize what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. I just want us as a people to get it done.